Hi everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from The Creative Pen and today I'm here with Meg Cowley. Hi Meg. Hello. <laughs> it's great to have you on the show. Just a little introduction. Meg is an author and illustrator. She writes the fantasy series Books of Caladan and also writes and illustrates the children's book series Diary of a Secret Witch. And now Meg has a range of adult colouring books, which is what we're talking about today, which is super exciting. But Meg, just start by telling us a bit more about you and how you got into writing and illustration. Okay, um, I suppose like most people, I've done it since forever, you know, as soon as I could pick up a pencil I was drawing, as soon as I could write, I was writing stories. Um, they were quite bad, all, you know, all the illustrations and all the stories, but you know, when you keep at something you eventually get better. Um, the, the first book I wrote was books of, the first book of Caladan and that just sort of popped into my head and I just had to write it down and you know like many first novels it's a very long and convoluted process until you sort of learn what you're doing and then it gets a bit easier and faster um, from there on in and I mean it really helped um, discovering you to be honest about I think about I was trying to think this morning um, probably just over three years ago I found you and that's where I, the penny dropped and I thought, hmm, hang on, I could actually get these books out into the world and you know, I made the business decision that actually I didn't want to traditionally publish and that I did want to um, to do this as an independent author and that's where it started and then, um, I mean, I, I focused on the writing for a bit and then once I found out about adult colouring books, again, it was like, wow, well, I love drawing. I've drawn for so many years and, and done a little, you know, a few commissions and things like that, but mostly just personal art. And then it was a thing of, well, I could do this. I could illustrate that project and I also know how to publish it. Mm. Why the heck not? Let's let's give it a try. And luckily it worked out. So that's something I'm I'm really happy to focus on for the next few months. Hey, so I'm really interested and I specifically wanted to talk to you around adult colouring books, which you, you know, been very mm -hmm. kind to come on and talk about. So mm. um, 2015 yeah. was a big year for you, wasn't it? So tell us what yes. happened and why you got into this area and how it went. Um, well, to be honest, at the end of 2014, I had just published my first fiction book and I was maybe hoping to publish the sequel in 2015, um, but I hadn't really planned out anything other than that. Um, and unfortunately, my health was quite poor last year due to a number of things that happened in 2014. So um, I wasn't really in a good place to write. I find that I need a, a lot of a clarity of thought, I suppose, to, to write and, you know, a clear head, nice environment, good health, things like that. And then it, it, the words kind of flow. But for drawing and things, I find that easier. I, you know, if my head's thick, it, it just kind of comes. It, it, that sounds really weird. It just flows. Mm. And my friend suggested to me, I'd, I'd already heard of adult coloring books. She was like, why don't you do one? And the more I thought about it, the more I thought, well, I, yeah, I actually could. Um, so I thought, well, I'll, I'll start drawing one and just see what happens. So I planned out the wild coloring book, which was my first one. I thought it would be a year of nature in the British Isles. So um, is that the coffee I sent you? <laughs> Yes, I think so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, a year of a year of nature in the British Isles. So lots of um, plants and animals that you might see in the British Isles. And I thought, well, yeah, let's let's give it a go. And the first one came out, and I admit I I didn't follow it up as quickly as I ought to have done. I think a key lesson from you know generally indie publishing is get everything out as fast as you can. You know, be a productive machine really. Mm. Um, so that's what I'm trying to do this year is to keep up that production schedule. Mm. Um, but once I saw how well it had gone, I mean, it was a pun. It was, I'll stick it out there and see what it's going to do. Um, I thought, well, well, let's follow it up. So that's when I did my second one and now I'm working on my third one. Um, and the sales are really encouraging. It's It's really nice to find a niche of the market where I can actually produce something that I feel is a good product and I can also make an income from it. Um, something that I'm really keen to do is keep my integrity. I, I said this to you um, the other day that I have to believe in what I'm doing um, to be able to convincingly do it, I suppose, mm. rather than just going into niche where they sell well, but I might not necessarily enjoy or be good at doing it. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Which is, you know, which is amazing. Can you give, um, I, you don't have to give figures, obviously, but an indication of how much better the colouring books have been for you than the fiction sales? Oh, astronomically, like thousands of percent. <laughs> um, for example, today I've sold about 4,000 books in total. Um, right. So this is going from July 2014, so it's like 18 months or so. Um, I don't particularly do any marketing, so I know it could be better. That's one of my 2016 goals, learn how to market stuff. 
but out of about 4,000 books, um, about 3,800 are colouring related. Oh. So. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh no, it's really good. It is. <laughs> Not for my fiction, but yeah, it's good for the colour. Well, and I think that's important. And you mentioned integrity. So what we're not suggesting in this interview is that people um, go and get stock photos from free websites and turn them into kind of crappy uh, colouring books. That's not what we're saying here. No. And um, you there, know, ha- there have been a few webinars about that and I would mm. steer away from that. <laughs> Yeah, and I th- but I think that's true of, you know, the indie market in general. There's always going to be people who are trying to jump on man wagons. But I'm someone who does colour as an adult and you're someone who, you know, produces these books in a, you know, with, with integrity. And, um, you know, coming clean on this, as, as you know, and telling the audience, my dad is a, an artist and he's interested in producing a colouring book. So... Um, yeah. at- he isn't so he's an artist first and now only considering doing this um later so let's which is what i was too it's it's trying to think about new niches that you can you know do the same thing in i guess which yeah it's great the opportunities that are there yeah, and he sells his artistic. So each of these uh, illust- uh, are their lino prints on paper. So they are individual artworks. But of course, they are mm. when they're individual artworks, they're not scalable. Whereas put them in a book and a coloring book or whatever, they are immediately scalable. So it's a right. yeah, it's a Absolutely. very good idea if you if you own images that are suitable. So first of all, can we just talk about the suitability of an illustration? So what are because you know um, people will immediately have in their head all kinds of different pictures especially if they don't color so what are the best mm-hmm. types of illustrations for these coloring books what makes a good adult coloring book <laughs> firstly steer away from everything you know about coloring books you know um so most people think of coloring books and children's coloring books so very simplistic images lots of big spaces thick lines and adult coloring books are a whole new dimension to that so first and foremost you're going to be working in black and white and um, you can't really print the gradients very well, so it's it's just better not to bother. And also, it's it's quite important not to give your um, your colorists, the people who are going to be coloring your book, any preconceptions about what they ought to do and how they ought to color your images. So if you're adding the shading in, you're actually saying, "Hey, I want you to color my image this way." And actually, take your emotions out of it because they're going to do their own thing with that piece. So black and white. I'd say you can work traditionally or digitally. Um, So I have a digital graphics tablet, um, which is basically like drawing onto a onto a digital canvas. Um, So it's not about taking images that are already on online and things. It's about creating your own from scratch, basically. Whether you do that in a digital or traditional um, medium, I use um, pencil sketches, and these are really good brands of pens. I don't know if you can see them, Mm -hmm. but these are Stadler fine liners, and they're really, really good. The quality of the ink is fantastic. So you want to be using um, decent quality materials, like with anything, to create them. Um, And you can kind of, as long as you have the tools to make your images digital, so as long as you can scan them into a computer, if they're not already um, drawn digitally, there's really no limits to what you can do. Um, I would say definitely pick a theme. Um, Mm. No one really wants to colour a robot and then a flower. Um, So the themed books tend to do really well. Some people Mm. might, all right, but most people don't. Um, So the themes tend to do really well. Um, So if you've got a flower book or a mandala book, that kind of thing. Um, the only thing I would say there is be really conscious of copyright. So, for example, something I would love to do is do a Lord of the Rings colouring book or a Harry Potter colouring book, but I cannot touch them for copyright reasons because I will be selling someone else's characters even though it's my artwork. So you've got to be quite original in what in what you're selling. Um, Oh. On that, you're, I mean, you could do um, fantasy characters book and, and do your own characters from your books of Caladan, for example, mm-hmm. which might be a kind of crossover niche. <laughs> that is possible. Um, and it's something I could consider, but I also like to try and think of things that are going to be commercially viable as well. So <laughs> I'm mixing sort of, I know, I'm mixing integrity with sensible business decisions. So what do I want to do and what's going to make enough money for me to pay my bills? Mm. So that could be great. If Books of Caladan becomes like a Harry Potter movie sensation, I'll be there. I'll be making a coloring <laughs> book. <laughs> but for now, I'm going to leave that one. Yeah. Um, the last thing I was going to say about creating the book, um, moving away from children's book to adult's book is... 
be really careful about your use of negative space. So you don't want too many lines. You don't want too few. So people want a variety of, of images in terms of complexity. Some, you know, they might want to do a really finely detailed piece and others they might not. But what you want to get away from is having too much black space or too much white space um, in your books as well. So not too many lines and you're not filling it in for them because um, that tends to really annoy people when they're like, I've bought this book but half of it's black and I can only colour in these tiny gaps. Yeah, so, yeah, and that's one of the problems with my dad's stuff. But what we're thinking about is scanning the images and then removing some of his his lines to make it a kind That of, would be perfect. Yeah, exactly. to make it a so sparse you, image. Yeah, you could definitely adapt it. Yeah, that's possible. Yeah, and I think that's really important because you have to, a, a drawing, a, an illustration, any kind of artwork has the same copyright as any other work, right? So in order yeah. to adapt you know, my dad's he uh, work, he can't sell it to someone else and then adapt it himself. He has to uh, own the rights to that work. So that's yeah. really important, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. And I would say be really careful um, with your own artwork, what you do with it. Um, so if you do sell your artwork, are you selling the copyright to that image? You need to understand what you're selling. Are you selling the rights for people to use that work? In what context? Um, I looked at licensing some of my artwork out. That can also be a really, really good uh, method of income for particularly colouring book pages because there's a lot of magazines out for colouring at the moment. They've all gone, oh, hey, this is the thing. We can make a lot of money. Let's do that. Um, now, they license images from online libraries and they're also starting to try and find illustrators as well because they've realised that all the other magazines are licensing the same images from the same libraries. So to try and, you know, differentiate themselves and be a bit different, um, they're going to artists now, but you have to be so careful about what you're giving away because generally they will let you keep the copyright to your images, which is perfect, mm. but they stipulate that maybe you have to be exclusive with them for a certain period of time or you can't print it in any other context or perhaps they're getting, you know, rights to print it worldwide for as long as they like and you have to be really careful with that because you don't ever want to give someone all your artwork for as long as they like you want to be able to get it back like with any publishing contract you want mm. to think okay when are the rights going to come back to me so there's a lot of things you can do with selling your artwork on but you've got to be really really aware of what your rights are and what you're giving away and keeping uh, and then I just wanted to follow up on the um your tablet um just tell people what what the actual specific tablet is is it a Wacom is it or you know what what, yeah, what is um... it specifically <laughs> I'd grab it, it's a little bit far away, but yeah. um, my baby is a Wacom Intuos 4, um, so it's about this big, and the active area is 6 by 8 inches. It comes with um, a normal size pen, which is called a stylus, because that's more fancy, and um, you basically draw on it, and it creates the same thing that you're drawing on the screen. It has pressure sensitivity, so it's just like using real pens and pencils. If you're pressing harder, there's a bigger blob on the screen, you, but you can do so much more with it, because you can do different brush types, sizes, colours, transparency. It's awesome. Um, I use that in conjunction with Photoshop. That's always been the program that that I found best to illustrate on. Um, I doubt it was intentionally intended as an illustration program, but it's versatile. It's enough to do it, and I find it's just awesome. Yeah, no, so that's, that's what I use. That's fantastic. Okay, so uh, next, so that that covers the method of illustration, I guess, and how to. Yeah. Um, oh, just more about the specific image. So um, whether you scan it or you do it directly into the software, yeah. does it need to be? And I'm not very good on this. Is it a vector image where it's a scalable size, or what? What format does the image need to be in in order to put it into a book? Don't laugh, but I really don't use vectors. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I so what do should, you use I don't. what do you use i i scan it in or if i'm drawing in a digital canvas i just it's as if i'm just drawing on a piece of paper um i create it in 600 dpi resolution so that's 600 dots per inch and i always make sure that the um size of the image is the final size in the book so for example 20 centimeters by 20 centimeters at 600 dpi um the recommended printing dpi is 300 so I use CreateSpace and they have printed out images for me at 199 dpi um, and I found that there is no loss of quality on that but I tend to err on the side of caution and I would say you know go a bit higher if you can or a minimum of 300 dpi. Um, now I use JPEG files 
or PNG file. So, you know, dead simple, dead straightforward. Most image software should be able to render those. Um, and I basically insert them in a Word file. I format all my books in Word, stick it as a PDF, upload it to CreateSpace. Away you go. <laughs> Yeah, what's, amazing. what's brilliant is you you are basically using the apart I mean obviously does the illustration itself that's where your art your art is but you're using the most ba yeah. basic method of publishing possible aren't you <laughs> literally yeah it's like idiot's guide right here no it's, but but that's fantastic because it's you know what what they would call the minimum viable product in the in the startup community but um obviously the i think the important point to stress there is that you're creating the images at the size for the book you're already writing yeah. or creating so for my dad for example his his prints some of them are a3 size so we need to scale them down to I don't think I don't think create space to an A3 book. No, exactly. So we have to somehow scale them down. And also another benefit yeah. of of getting a thing like a vector image is that we could put those same images on a mug or a business card or that type of thing. To right? be, yeah, to be honest though, um I wouldn't have any problem with doing that without I mean I don't vector my images at all and I don't have any problem the rule of thumb is as long as you've got a decent DPI and a decent file size in pixels or centimeters whichever dimensions you're using you can translate it to other formats so why I tend to start big is that it's then suitable to use to make for small. other formats so the illustration is the biggest thing that is the same size as the cover so I can then use it for the cover and color that in and mm. um, I can then scale it down for things like business cards mugs it's it's quite versatile so if you make it the, it's hard to it's hard to go from small to big it's easier to go from big to small yeah. so if you make it bigger you can do a lot more with it that's great. You mentioned there about the cover um, and colouring it in because you do notice some of these covers are kind of half coloured in, like you're going to colour in the rest of the book. Is that... Um... That's what I did with mine. <laughs> yeah, we, no, which is great. And I can see the, the marketing angle of that. It's like, yes, this is a colouring in book. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I guess there aren't any rules though. Like we could still do a black and white cover. It's not necessary mm -hmm. but do you have any uh, like from all the books you've seen are there any other tips around the cover itself color <laughs> oh right <laughs> definitely color i would say it's the same sort of thing as publishing a fiction book you don't want a lot of white space because white space blends into the web page you want something that's going to pop and make someone's eye stop and think hmm that looks nice i'm going to click on that um at thumbnail size obviously um so yeah i would say definitely have a pop of color i did experiment with my second book doing it in full color as i did with my first one but that i actually found that when i looked at it it was just a bit too much it was a bit overpowering so i ended up just doing a little circle of color in the middle and that worked for me i thought hmm, that's aesthetically pleasing that's going to be eye catching so i think it does depend on the artwork that you're using but i would say that color tends to rank higher um the duller the cover the lower they seem to rank when i pull through i'm really sad when i go through all the amazon listings of color coloring books no no you're not sad and we'll come back to that because <laughs> it's really really handy so I, um i've just got lots of random questions here but um so how many yeah, go for it. how many pages uh do you need and do you print on both sides right this is where you have to be really really aware of your audience and what they want so I again it depends how much you want to print you can really do a short book or a long book whatever you want but I would say price your work accordingly so I do around 30 images in my books but I price it at significantly less than the books that have got a lot more images in so to represent that what you're getting and, and offer fair value for that so you can really hit whatever you want but I'd say a good place to start is about 20 when people buy a colouring book they don't want a couple of pieces of paper to do they want quite a quite a chunk mm. um, and then how you format it is really quite important so this is where I've been through loads of popular colouring books and unpopular ones and read the reviews and seen what people actually thought of them and that was the most important thing I did when it was when, it, when I was deciding how to format the book, basically, because mm -hmm. they showed me what not to do. Um, so every complaint in every review, I was thinking, right, log that. I'm not going to do that. So, for example, 
Um, I would say don't print on both sides of the, of the paper. Um, now, part of that is due to the paper quality that you will get if you are printing on demand because it's not as thick mm. um, as a traditional publisher might be able to do. But generally, um, people might want to cut out that image when they've finished with it and frame it. Oh, and if you've got an image on the back of that, yeah. <laughs> wow. oh, yeah. And if you've got an image on the back of that, they're then having to sacrifice an image and that really annoys people because they're like I've bought a book I want to enjoy all the images but instead I'm having to enjoy half of them and um, especially if you're using materials that are going to bleed through a page as well you're essentially destroying what's on the other side mm. so I'd say definitely do one-sided because then people can cut them out present them or they don't have to choose at the very least between what's on both sides and um, so following on from not drawing into the spine um, or the edges of the page because people struggle to colour it all in. Again, going across both pages as well. There's nothing more lovely than opening up a colouring book to hear, to see this beautiful double page spread, but you can't colour the middle of it. It's really annoying for people, so don't do it. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's, there's all sorts of practical implications that you have to think about when you're designing it, because ultimately what you're doing after you've drawn the artwork is trying to figure out what the end consumer of that product wants and giving it to them. So you have to stop thinking like the artist who's drawing the images and start thinking like the colorist who's going to color them. And what do I want to sit down and do when I open my coloring book up? Mm -hmm. um, so I'd say that also going back to what I said at the beginning about um, making sure you've not got too much positive and negative space. Make sure that you've got a range of complex designs. So some people, sometimes they just want to colour in a really big space because they can't be bothered doing all the detail. And other times that's going to really annoy them and they want to get into the little nitty gritty bits. And so if you give them a variety of designs where they can do one or the other or both, then people are going to be a lot happier. And I've seen reviews sort of both ways saying oh it's too complex it's not complex so again give them a mix and um, and the last thing I tried which seems to work quite well mm. and I've not seen any other coloring book do this um, is using a tester page so right at the front of my books I put just a blank page with sort of an invitation to scribble on it you know try out your materials try out your coloring techniques and it means that people don't have to choose an image to sacrifice with a potentially bad material or colouring technique. They can just go and do it on that page. And I'm sure most people have a spare piece of paper, but if not, then again, you're giving them the solution right there. So it's about trying to, um, if there are any problems, fix them right in your book. <laughs> mm. And then on that, do you write anything in the book so like do you have a you know well like a welcome page uh and then uh, or a um anything about you the artist you know like an end matter or you know yeah what what do you actually put in the book apart from images um so yeah I do all those things I put an introduction at the front which is basically saying hey welcome to my book I hope you enjoy it and I like to point out all the little things I've done for them like not drawing into the spines in case mm. they want to cut the artwork out and things like that so if they haven't thought about it you might give them a nice idea and if they have they think oh ain't she sweet she's caring about what me the colorist wants so I think that helps build a nice relationship with the colorist because they feel like you're not just some mass-produced book you actually care about their enjoyment of the product and this is about their enjoyment really because coloring is a luxury I suppose um, mm. and a therapy for some people so if you make them feel like you care about them then that you know in increases their enjoyment of the book um, mm. and yeah I do I do stick the usual hi you know this is a bit about me at the end of the book and please leave a review at the end of the book so yeah, which is fantastic. And of course, I, we're going to give your, um, this is Meg Cowley, everybody, and you can go and buy her <laughs> colouring books and model. We all model success. So this is very important. Mm -hmm. But just back on the theme there, because I just remembered, of course, a lot of people do this for therapy. And, and in fact, pretty much mm -hmm. all the yeah. all the colouring books in the shops have, um, you know, garden colouring book for enhancing your calm or for stress relief mm -hmm. do you, keywords yes well this is what I was going to ask uh -huh. you so and and all they also have adult coloring book on the front mm -hmm. as well yeah. so what what are you what have you found are the best kind of ways to do that is it literally because everybody's got calm and mindfulness and all that I know right? you know what I mean <laughs> is it is it just a case of fitting into that niche at this point yeah I mean I'll just grab one of my books um so I have this is one of my books and it's the calm keyword, coloring book, creative keyword, art therapy keyword, 
for adults. Keyword. <laughs> and the series is called Colouring Books. Keyword. For adults. Keyword. <laughs> so basically, what you're trying to do with your title is think, what's going to get me noticed on Amazon? So this is where you sit and type into the, the search bar on Amazon all the things that you can think of with colouring. And you can sort of pick up on the keywords that are going to come out. And that's what you... Try and stuff in your title and your keyword and your seven keywords and all the rest of it. Mm. Um, so I would say, yeah, go with as much as they're overused at the moment, go with them because that's what's going to get you noticed. That's what's going to get you selling. Yeah, absolutely. You can't avoid this type of thing. And, and essentially, it's a non-fiction book. I mean, weirdly, it is it is a non-fiction book. And, mm, and we yeah. know that key, you have to have keyword titles for non-fiction. I've seen them ranked in some bizarre category, honestly. But And people say, oh, I'm ranked number one. And I'm thinking, yes, in a completely weird category. But, you know, if you can get into them, go for it. Hypnosis or something. <laughs> exactly, yeah. I was... Um, I think both of mine are top 10 or something like that in self-help so but it is a self-help book so that's quite book. helpful to rank yes and in fact I was thinking about this because um I think my dad's is going to be an English country garden you know house and garden type of thing it's very mm. gardeny in English and yeah. um you know th that that could you know go into a gardening category as much as it doesn't yes. have to go in coloring books does it that's the thing it, no. it, it can go across genre as such yeah, the only thing you're limited by is um, the, the bicep codes, really. Um, so I put mine in self-help slash creativity. Um, there are some other ones that I would like to get into, but because they don't have a code for it, I can't get into them. Like the colouring books for adults category, it doesn't have a code that creates Facebook Accept, or it didn't last time I checked, which mm. sounds ridiculous, but you kind of have to work with what what you've got. Um, but yeah, you could definitely get into some really obscure niches. But it's interesting. I mean, obviously, this is a colouring book, so it doesn't make sense to have an ebook version. But do you have uh, an ebook version oh, anyway? Well. Because then you can uh -huh. get into these other categories. Um, I would say no to an ebook because um, if you do it, for example, with KDP, what you're actually going to be giving people is a book that they can't print and they can't colour. Um, so it's more of a, a viewing piece, which I suppose might be quite nice, um, but it's not really the point of the it. Point, the yeah. point is a colouring book. Now, the way around that is to do a print your own copy. Um, so, for example, I'm set up on payhip.com, mm. um, which is one of many platforms that you can do um, where, where you basically sell a PDF copy, which you can discount off the paperback. So people are getting a good bargain. People can print as many copies as they want. So obviously they can, they can get quite good value for money off that. And they handle the nitty gritty things like paying you. Super high roll is like 90%. Mm. Um, and they handle EU VAT and all that kind of thing. So that's the way around it. But then you're off the mainstream platforms like Amazon. So you're really sort of um, using your own popular popularity and yeah you have to have a well-trafficked you know, web website really for that yeah yeah absolutely yeah so I, I don't particularly market those if I'm honest but they're kind of like oh they're here if you want them kind of thing yeah like an, an extra thing yeah no that's good mm -hmm. okay um right let's talk about publisher because my immediate um thought was create space which is great is still mm -hmm. not the best, as you said before, it's not the best paper quality. And the top, you know, the number one best-selling colouring book, which I also have, the Joanna Basford one, Secret, oh, Secret I know. Garden. I have it too. Yeah, it's everyone beautiful. has it. That's why it made half a million pounds last year. Um, but yeah. the, the paper quality is exceptional, isn't it? And I don't think there's any it's bleed cute. with with even kind of thick colouring pens yeah. but we can't do that because it's way too expensive to be able to produce a book like that yeah. so um what investigations have you done around uh, around paper and what have you ended up with it's really hard because you have to choose between the two camps you either get the product that you want with zero just distribution and you sit on two thousand copies and try and sell them which no one, no one should do really because that's just really a bad idea as you frequently say mm. or there's the other camp which is you kind of make the best of what you've got um so there's create space obviously they have the one paper choice between cream and white that that's it that's the thickness so if you've handled any paperback book that's the thickness of paper you're working with um now, it is suitable for colouring crayons and water-based inks, but alcohol markers you will struggle with. Um, so I, I really like alcohol markers. They they are the most versatile, um, which is really frustrating, but they bleed on this paper. So you kind of have to compromise there. 
Um, I did also look at Ingram Spark. Um, now that was more to get into bookstores because the first thing I thought was clearing books are everywhere. I don't want to be limited to Amazon. I want to be getting into my local Waterstones, my local independents, that kind of thing. Um, now Create Space, you'll struggle with that because the publishers cannot get the margins that they want and you cannot get the margins that you want, you know, simultaneously. So I thought, okay, maybe I should consider Ingram where they can give the bookshops the, the margins that they do want to persuade them to stock them. But when I went into the bookshop, um, and this was this was well before I published, this was probably just over a year ago, mm. um, just to see what colouring books they had in, I saw the paper quality and I thought, I can't I can't put my book next to that. So I thought, right, okay, let's let's steer away from going into bookshops at the moment and stick with Amazon. And I know that Amazon is a great marketing vehicle. Um, you shared an article a few weeks ago about, oh, what was her name? Oh, there was the, the coloring book artist who'd made like yeah. half a million dollars or something self-publishing through Amazon. Um, I think I've got it written down somewhere. Janine Morrison, that's it. Mm. So it's quite clear that you can do it online only, um, but there isn't really a way to do it and get into bookshops and have that quality product. Um, yeah, did, yeah. So, so it, did it was you... a shame. Yeah, and that's the thing. And uh, like you say, you have to make that choice um, at this point. But have you had uh, complaints or bad reviews around paper quality that have affected sales, I guess? And we all get bad reviews, so mm. that's not an issue. But um, yeah, has that happened? So I had to make a, a choice between creating the, this luxurious quality product um or creating a more affordable, budget-friendly version based on the materials that I had to use. So that was what I had to do, um, but I reflected that accordingly in the price. So whereas the market leaders' um, RRPs are about £10 or upwards, mine are priced at £5 or, or thereabouts. Um, to reflect that, you're actually paying for a more budget product, and I think that's been well-received. I think people, prolific colourers, perhaps I should say, appreciate the fact that they can buy and colour and buy and colour and it's not going to break their bank and um, so there's just the one review that I've had about the poor paper quality and, and that's it. Well that's great and and I think by being putting that stuff up front about testing like people haven't ruined ruined you know some of the pages so that's that's really super and I also uh, you have Square don't you what how's that you know why did you choose Square rather than a different size? Um, in the second book I chose Circles to be honest might do triangles next. Um, it, it just, the illustrations that I was doing fit a square quite nicely, um, whereas the illustrations in the second book that I've done fit a circle quite nicely. So it was but just sort of the, going with the flow. The print, the print size yeah. you did was a square rather than oh, more of sorry, a book shape. Yeah. Um, again, it was just the illustrations that I were doing. Um, they looked quite a lot nicer as a square rather than a rectangle. So I thought rather than creating a rectangular book with a square image in the middle, I would be better just creating a square book. But there are some people who do A4 or, you know, that sort of um, mm. ratio height to width books and, and they work quite well too. So you, you, you've got a bit of versatility to choose what you want to do with them, um, to be honest. Yeah, no, fan fantastic. Uh, okay. Um, so I'm just trying to think what else we have. So let's just talk about the, the, we've talked a bit about the pros and cons of indie in terms of, you know, if you get a traditional deal for a colouring book uh, right now, you could have that really great quality, but it might take six months, um, you know, really to, to yeah. get out there. So what are the other sort of pros and cons of, of indie have you found? I think the, the key one that you've just mentioned is speed to market. Indies have definitely got the edge when it comes to that. I mean, Joanna Basford is releasing her next book in, I think, this August it's scheduled for. And by that time, I'm hoping I can put three more out. So it, it, and I think this seems to be a common thing that indies are trying to push the boundaries. It's not, I've got this book ready, I'm going to sit on it for a year. I've got this book ready, I'm going to publish it now. And that's the, the freedom that we have. So these books are really easy to create once you've actually done the illustration. The formatting is so simple mm. that you could literally upload the formatting um, to Create Space, and I think the record that I've had is I've uploaded it on a Sunday morning. It's been on Amazon by midday, and I've had it on in my lap on the Tuesday, which is amazing. <laughs> it so, is. 
it is absolutely amazing yeah, and of course um, and of course you mentioned the distribution to bookstores um and mm-hmm. you know I'm con- I am considering looking into Ingram Spark but I'm kind of with you mm-hmm. in that even if you if you end up going with Ingram Spark and you pay for the best quality you possibly can then your royalties are going to be very small with the discounting yeah. and everything and then plus you mm-hmm. probably still won't be able to get the quality of a Joanna Bassford so why <laughs> Why go to the eighty percent and yeah. lose the money? Whereas you know, yeah. it's, it's very, it's a, it's a difficult thing though. Um, it is really difficult. Yeah, yeah, that is that is tough. But I'm de- I'm really interested in in you know probably what I'll probably do is order order a couple of you know different price points and see the quality. I think that's that's the aim, isn't mm-hmm. it? Here, um, just order I think the, some. The best, yeah, the best thing I did was go into the bookshop and just handle and, and look at what they actually have because that was a massive eye opener for me to think, right, that's what I'm up against in the real world. Um, mm. So yeah, definitely. But mm. we, we also have a lot more versatility as indies so we can push out a lot of different products as well, which I think gives us a great edge so we can still be putting out quality products all right paper quality is not the not the most fantastic but as far as the actual content goes we are up there you know we can be just as good as all the other people who are publishing them but we can also create more diverse products so something that this is something that I'm using to diversify my income streams the business side of me is like money (laughs) which is what it's it's the internal struggle of every indie. It's, I want to create this wonderful thing. And the other half is like, yes, but I need to pay my mortgage. Yeah. Show us your diversified portfolio. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, sounds like a stockbroker. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this is my second colouring book, which was the Calm Colouring Book. Now, I also brought this out as a 2016 diary. And this has been really successful. Oh. Um, this actually outsold my first colouring book in December by far and I actually get a better margin on it as well so that's quite nice um, I also brought it out as an A4 notebook as well so both of these have all the illustrations in that the Calm colouring book do but they also have the extra benefits of in this case it's got notebook paper um, about 100 pages worth and then this one is a week per page diary as well. So with all the extra things that you'd expect from a diary. And it's been really well received. It's been so well received because, again, this was a pun that I went back and did one for my first coloring book as well. Um, and that's already started selling. I kind of sneakily published that a week ago and it's already starting to trickle in. I haven't told anyone about it yet. I love and, it. And that's I love really- this. I think this I is amazing because yeah, you what you've done is just shrink those colouring things down on the page and then fill the rest of the page with like blank lines mm-hmm. for a notebook. Yeah, or yeah. you've presumably downloaded some kind of template of the 2016 diary. I have made that. Oh, you have made it. That's lovely. No, <laughs> I'm I'm actually using this one as well, and you're gonna laugh because look what I've started doing this year. My little sticker reward oh, chart. Awesome. So you've got stickers in there too. And are you yeah. have you thought about creating stickers from your artwork to sell as well? It's that's something in there. I mean, the, once you start thinking about what else can I put the images that I have already drawn on, like you just start to think of so many things. I think you've got to be careful because you could literally stamp everything. Yeah. So you're trying to think about, okay, what's going to sell? Because I would love to make stickers. That'd be amazing, but probably not many people would buy them unless they were on Amazon. Um, but yeah, I'm trying to think of different projects that I could do. Mm. One that I did think of um, was, and this is quite funny, and you can't do it, unfortunately, was just a blank notebook. So completely blank pages with a lovely like motif sort of cover. But unfortunately, Amazon doesn't let you print more than three blank pages in a row. I don't know if you've ever had that telling off from them. Uh, okay, but you could do three blank pages, then a colouring in, three blank pages, then a colouring in. Yes, yes, you could. <laughs> <laughs> and then, I mean, this, this is the thing. Once, um, And this is what's so brilliant because, I, you know, I write wordy books and you can't do, I mean, you, yes, there are multiple formats, ebook, mm. print, audio book, but you know then it's adaptation into screenplay or whatever but but I love this um I love this image stuff I think it's brilliant I'm gonna have to start (laughs) doing some art classes or something (laughs) definitely but this is what I was trying to do because it was trying to create that model of multiple input and income streams like you have the little infographic where you've got your one book and then it turns into an ebook and a print and an audio book and then times number of languages times number of countries I was thinking well I can't make 
an audio book of a coloring book or I can't make an ebook. What else can I do with it? Mm -hmm. And as it turns out, there's quite a lot if you just sit down and have a think and even just trying to think as a writer or an artist, what do I actually want? And then thinking, oh, well, maybe I could do that myself. And mm -hmm. I think that's the greatness of the indie world. It's sitting down and thinking, oh, I need this. I can solve that problem myself. Aww. So I'm really enjoying the diary because it's got in everything that I want in a diary. <laughs> That's absolutely brilliant. Um, so what I wanted to ask was also about marketing. Now you said, oh, I don't do much marketing, but uh, you did a lot of work around keywords. Clearly you've, you looked at all the books mm -hmm. in the store, looked at all the, the positives and negatives, and you actually have created a product that people want, which in itself mm -hmm. is marketing. So this, you have done a lot of that, but what about other things? So um, for example, are there book bloggers for coloring books or do you use Facebook ads or what, what are the other options for marketing? Yeah. So all the things that you've said I'm doing, like, that's great. That's sort of the background work. I think of it as mm. um, marketing to me is the act of getting out there and being like, Hey, buy my book without being like, Hey, mm. buy my book. Um, so there was a Facebook blogger who started up at around the same time that I did my first book and she is now really successful which is awesome because she's reviewed so many coloring books by now um, but she was the first person to sort of handle and review my book and luckily she gave it a good review which I think has helped subsequently and hmm. um, I've also toyed with Facebook ads but I've only run one or two that's something that I really want to, to push in 2016, um, my own education of understanding how to do them and then following through and running them. Um, I do have a colouring newsletter, a newsletter for my young adult fiction, my children's fiction and my colouring books. So it's three to keep up, but I figure you can't put them together because mm. the content is so different. So it's worth doing that. And the coloring newsletter is actually quite good, to be honest. There's quite a few followers. And I noticed that when I was doing lead generation Facebook ads, um, offering the same free download of colouring pages that I offer anyone who signs up to my mailing list, I got some really good results. Um, I think my cost per lead was about 13 pence, which was fantastic. So, and, and I only took a small punt on it, you know, 20, 20 pounds or so. So mm. it, it was good. It was encouraging. Um, the next one didn't do so well, but I think you learn what not to do as well as what to do. So yeah, yeah. something to expand on in 2016. Um, yeah. And have you uh, done any kind of in person, like would you print a number of them and try and hand sell them at events or anything like that? I did do a Christmas fair. Um, it did not go well. Oh, really? <laughs> I Yeah, it was a really, really small one. And I thought naively, yeah, I'm going to sell loads of book. my book, books. My books are awesome. Who wouldn't want to buy my books? So I bought about £200 of stock and I sold about 50 Um Luckily, I managed to then hand sell the rest of them online, um, but mm. I was really disappointed with that. So for future events, um, I would definitely say if you do want to do a Christmas fair, go to a bigger one where you've got high footfall, lots of different stalls that are offering a nice diverse range of products, possibly something a bit more um, artisanal. So it's a bit more different and niche rather than mass produced and you know, cheap and things like that. So yeah, there's there's opportunities there, but I think you have to plan carefully um, what you're doing. And again, learn from your mistakes. Yeah, no, that, that is fantastic. Um, mm. Okay, so the other thing I guess I wanted to ask is, uh, do you see this dropping off? I mean, obviously it's going to have to drop off from where it is. It, it's been ridiculous. Or was oh, it... it's not. I mean, but it's been crazy. Don't like... say that. <laughs> <laughs> but two two of the top 10 best selling books in 2015 were adult coloring books which to me it's awesome it's amazing which is why you know and you're doing well because you're you are surfing a wave with something that oh, you're yeah. already good All at right. so you're you know you're doing this as we said entirely with integrity but um i mean what have you learned about the adult coloring colorists as you say and do, i mean even if it fades a little do you see this as a market mm. that's just going to keep going yeah, I do. Um, I, I This is why I've been releasing a bit slower than perhaps what I ought to have done, because after the first one, it was like, hmm, is it going to sell? Is the next one going to be viable? After the second one, hmm, well, how's this one going to sell? Is another one going to be viable? But after sort of following people like Joanna Basford and hearing about what they're doing, um, the fact that the tra traditional publishing in industry is still following this and it is going to publish her book in August mm. rather than rushing another one out because I feel like they rushed out Lost Ocean, her third one, quite quickly. Um, and that made me worry, like, oh, are they just pushing it out now 
to maximise the sales and is it then going to drop off? The fact that they've then said, oh, we're not going to publish another one for, I think they made the, the announcement about nine months in advance. You know, we've got a whole nine months before this next one comes out. That made me think, right, they've got confidence that it's going to go well for at least the next nine months. So I think that that reflects for the rest of us that it can also go quite well. And I think for the moment, um, I'm just going to try and see where it goes. I'm just going to focus on that because that is the most commercially viable project line I'm working on at the moment. Mm -hmm. So focus on that, see where it goes. If I do really well, if I do as well as um, Janine Morrison, fantastic. If not, you know, we'll reevaluate um, as I think we indies do and just see what what's happening really but I, I think it's gonna stay for 2016 I think it might not be as strong as it was in 2015 but I think it'll stay yeah exactly and as you said you enjoy it and mm. it you know it, and it kind of comes naturally to you to do this work anyway um so yeah, you know why not <laughs> why not it's crazy so um where can people find you and your books and your coloring books and your free newsletter where people can download uh -huh. some coloring because that sounds cool <laughs> Um, to be honest, the easiest place to find me is my website. So it's www.megcowleek.com. I've links to all my free books and free colouring pages on there. If you don't want to visit my website and you just want to download my free colouring pages straight away, um, illustration.megcowleek.com and you can get some free samples from there. I also send out monthly free pages just because that's awesome. Um, who doesn't <laughs> love a free colouring page? Um, I'm also on Twitter at Meg underscore Cowley and I'm on Facebook at Facebook slash Meg Cowley so yeah and the Come books there, the books hi. are on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and yeah. all that yeah now I um I published all my books on Amazon so everything's available on Amazon and I've selected all the um expanded distribution so I presume they'll pop up somewhere on the ether <laughs> brilliant well thanks for your time Meg that was great that's welcome thank you very you're welcome thank you very much for having me on the podcast